Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. Our presentation and demonstration today is going to be covering Windows services. We're going to look at Windows 11 and Server 2022 and we're going to look at this diverse set of modular software that sits on top of the kernel. It provides this very broad set of functions to applications, to network, to just about everything that we need our operating system to do. Now in Windows Server 2008 R2 and Windows 7, Microsoft introduced the Manage Service Accounts. These are new ways of giving accounts to services. One was MSA and the other one's Virtual Service Account. One, they removed the need for password resets and two, they gave more granular control over these accounts that run on services. In Server 2016, Microsoft introduced the GMSA, or Group Managed Service Accounts. This just gave more control, more fine-tuning of privileges for those managed accounts. A lot of server applications need services to run with the application. These accounts to run that service are critical. Applications like Exchange, SQL, web servers, and containers all need special accounts so that they can run. Now in the days of Windows 7 and as we began to move into Windows 10, it was often you would see an svchost.exe service and you would explore it and find out there were many, many services running under one SVC host executable. Now, SVC host is known as a service host. It's a system process that can hold one or more Windows services running in that process. SVC host.exe is a shared service process that serves as a shell for loading services from DLL files. Back to Process Explorer and we'll look at our services again. Here's an SVC host and notice I have a lot of them. So how does the SVC host using the same executable launch so many different kinds of services? And the secret sauce is in the command line. So I'm going to choose this one, right mouse click, go to properties. We're using Using the SVC host.exe from the system32 folder. But look at this command line. That's what's actually determining what service has launched, that command line. Mark has also created a mouse over feature so that you can mouse over any particular SVC host and you can actually see it pop up and show you the command line and any specific registry settings that need to be implemented with that SVC host and its associated service are also shown in that mouse over. You can see it by going, clicking it and going back into properties but it saves you having to do that. You can just hover over each SVC host and you see basically the kinds of things you want to see. Remember in part one of this lecture, I told you that services are launched in a different session than the user applications and user software. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to go up to columns. I'm going to right mouse click and select columns. And under process image, I'm going to choose the option of sessions. And it's going to put the session column all the way over here to the far right and I'm going to click it and drag it over. And so now we can see the sessions that these services have been launched under. And we see a bunch of them launched under session zero. So these were launched early in the boot process. Every service is not always launched in session zero. Here I have a SVC host and it's actually launched in the same session as myself, the logged on user. Keep in mind that every service isn't in session zero. Microsoft selects services deliberately to isolate them from the user. Also, we want to note that not every service is an SVC host. Right above, I've got this nisserve.exe. This is a service. I can always tell that in Process Explorer by going to Properties, and I will always have a service 
tab. This service tab indicates that this is a service. So if you're not sure, always right mouse click, go to properties in Process Explorer, you should have a service tab. Again, another point to make about how critical they are. If you notice under services.exe, it launches an SVC host. And underneath that is all the frameworks and runtime brokers that make up the Windows Store apps. Now, I hope you picked up on what I just said in the last few slides, is that bottom line, services are simply DLLs. They, DLLs can't execute themselves, so they create a generic process, svchost.exe, so that they can be executed. But bottom line, services are just DLLs. Now, it was often the case you could come over and take Process Explorer and mouse over any SVC host, and you would see a long list of services that were in one single SVC host. But recently, the recent additions of Windows 10, Microsoft has made a big change. If you have 3.5 gigabytes of RAM or more on your PC, laptop, or client, you now, every single service gets its own SVC host.exe. So Microsoft's reason for doing that were many fold. Number one, increased reliability because they're isolating one service from another. Two, supposedly re reducing support costs because before you would have to then figure out a way of isolating these services running in the same SVC host from each other, causing more difficulty in troubleshooting. Increasing security because you're isolating and scalability. So these are some of the reasons why Microsoft is moving to every service in its own SVC host.exe. Both on the client side and the server, we run both 32-bit services and 64-bit services. Now, keep in mind, we don't always use an SVC host.exe executable to run a service. But if you do, and it's a 64-bit service, that SVC host.exe will come out of the System32 folder. If it's a 32-bit service, that same executable will come out of the SysWow64 folder. No administrator can talk about Windows services without also talking about the registry. Services are pretty easy to find in the registry. HK local machine, system, current control set, services. And all of the registry controls for those services are found there. If you're working on the client, make sure you do a restore point before you start modifying registry settings related to services. If you're on Windows Server, you can export any registry key so that you can have a backup should you need to restore that key. Let's take a look at the graphic on the right, and you can see we're looking at IP helper service, and I've chosen the dependency tab, and you can begin to see where it says this service depends on the following system components, and it has a list, network store, interface service, RPC, TCP IP protocol driver, and on and on and on. You can see these lists of services that IP helper depends on them functioning properly before it can function properly. And then below that is another, it says the following system components depend on IP helper and it lists network connectivity assistant. You can see this is very complex, the interdependence of one service to another service. Now I've taken that first dialog box and broken it down. I've kind of opened it all up and you can see this is quite complex. All of these services need to function correctly in order for IP helper service to function correctly. Now, when that gets into troubleshooting, any one of these could cause IP helper to not work properly or become unstable or to hang or to not start. It is much more complex to troubleshoot these than what you might think. This is a diagram showing kind of a breakdown of interdependence of services on a single host. Now, this gets more interesting. What if I have access running on a client and it's talking to an SQL database running on a server or running on a host server and then I have a database on a back end. So I've got three hosts involved with one application. You can have this network services interdependencies because it's a network client server application. Now, Microsoft has a number of ways to start services. And you see in my dialog box, I've pulled down the start type. So you see automatic delayed start. That was really to help Windows peer to boot a little bit better. Automatic, manual, and disable. These are all options for the administrator to decide how to start services. 
Now, Trigger Start is a feature that allows an event to trigger a service on. Just as we have the options to start a service, the Recovery tab gives you many, many options on what to do when a service is not working correctly. You have first failure, second failure, subsequent failures. It's automatically handling a service failure. Each of these options gives you things like take no action, just stop, don't do anything, restart the service, run a program, restart the computer. So there's lots of options here. When a service fails, what you can do in automating the response of the operating system to this failure of the service. Many server applications give you best practices for those recovery settings. Some of them even provide scripts that you can run upon a service failure. If you want to monitor your services, especially on a server, GitHub has many PowerShell scripts that are available for free that help you monitor your services and notify you if a service restarts or stops, etc. And it can even send you email. You can also use Task Manager to automate how often these scripts run on any schedule. Mr. Vanderpool, can I take any application and turn it into a Windows service? Well, yes and no. So there are third-party applications that allow you to take a normal user application and turn it into a Windows service. But there's a couple of things you need to think about. One, you'll have to manually update this application. Number two, make sure that the application is not already automatically running after logon prior to setting up this application as a service. Or you could wind up with two instances of that application running. Number three, you will not have an interface to this application once it becomes a service. Now, if you'll notice up to this point, I really haven't talked about any specific service. I've talked all around them, all about its features and security and everything, but the services themselves. So let's take a few minutes and dive into some really important services that I wanna highlight and make sure you're aware of what they are and what they do. Honestly, you need to get into the services GUI and read the descriptions. I've got a column here. You can stretch it out and you can just read the description of each and every service. It's a great way to learn what's in your operating system. So my first service that I want to talk about is called BITS, Background Intelligence Transfer Service. This is amazing. It's a tool that was added, I think, in Windows 7, maybe in Vista, and it takes the updates, no matter how large they are, and just sips them down from the update server so that you can pull down a huge file and never even know it. It doesn't seem to impact your network. It doesn't seem to impact your workstation because that's its job is to transfer files from Microsoft Update so that you don't ever know they're coming down and they don't really seem to impact. When this fails, it impacts Microsoft Update. So this is one that can be one you have to play with. I forgot that I did mention the clipboard service. If you've got administrative administrative workers who are heavy into Microsoft Word, especially law firms or administrative assistants where they use a lot of applications dealing with documents, clipboard service is going to be one of your headaches because when it goes south, trust me, there's no rest for your soul. The other one is DHCP client. Without it, you can't pull an IP address. So this can impact you pulling an IP address. So don't rule this out. Remember, you have a service that's actually pulling IP address from your DHCP server. Another important one, DNS client. This is your DNS resolver locally. If you have problems with this client, you're going to have issues. You can actually interact with this service by doing the IP config forward slash flush DNS and it flushes out the DNS caching. Another very important one is group policy client. Remember, as you're in an enterprise and you're pushing group policies down from your domain controller, a lot of times you can have problems with that. And one thing you want to do is just restart this service. You can't be in the enterprise at any length of time, especially in the help desk, that you don't come to know and hate this service, Prince Spooler. So if you have a corrupted file, boom this dies. I'm always amazed how many techs that I bump into that don't understand server service. You, with this service on, you can share folders, files, and printers to the network. If I disable that service, you can't do anything on the network. You can't share a folder, share a file. In fact, you just disappear from the network. Another service that I'm always amazed that people that I bump into don't have a clue what it is, and that's the workstation service. This allows you to look on the network and see servers. If I disable that, you can't see anything on the network. 
you are blind. Now I just picked a few because I don't want you sitting in front of a screen for hours listening to me ramble. But get in there and learn some of these great services that Microsoft puts on your workstation. So as we look at troubleshooting services, always think about starting with third party services first before you start looking at Microsoft services. Now, as we begin to troubleshoot services, we're going to start with Event Viewer because that will at least help us to start to dig down to possibly discover what our problem is. Here I'm in Windows 11, which is very similar to Server. It's slightly different. I'm gonna to go to my Windows Start Square, I guess you could call it, and launch Event Viewer. Now, I want to filter out events that are based on what happened to Service Control Manager because any event failure or problem is going to be reflected in the Service Control Manager. I could start with Windows Logs, go to System, and I could then filter those logs. I would say critical, warning, error, and I want to filter based on event source called System Control Manager. And I'd slide down there and find this rascal. So I'm going to check that box say OK. And now I can actually and now I'm going to look at all the log files or events that happened in the Windows system log that had related to the system control manager. Now, if this was Exchange service or an application service, then I would do the same thing. I'd go under application event logs and I would find the event, the application event log and I would filter the same way. That's a good place to start. We all know that events, IDs and event descriptions are not always helpful but it's at least a good place to begin. Many different type failures in services require looking for a variety of event IDs for problems. For example, you could have an authentication failure that causes a server to fail to start. You've got to look at a whole different type of event ID for that. Services can cause unexpected reboots. So you would look at, say, event ID 41. Services can cause application hangs or faults. So you'd look at uh, event IDs 1002 or 1000. Services can time out. So you would look at event ID 7009. Now, I wish I could tell you that I could give you this magical list of event IDs and your problems would be solved. It's never that simple. It takes years of experience doing administration, working with applications, troubleshooting. All of that combined gives you a basic understanding of how to troubleshoot these applications. They'll all be slightly different. Often services fail due to missing DLL files or corrupted DLL files. If you feel like you have a service that's failing due to corrupted DLLs or missing DLLs, you can always use the dism.exe with these arguments and switches to go to update and pull down any missing files that you may have. Also, sfc forward slash scan now can help you recover missing or corrupted files. You can also perform this in safe mode if necessary. sfc will give you a log file called cbs.log and you can review it to see what did it fix. You must run your command prompt in elevated credentials and you can see I'm running dism on my system right now. Here was where I ran SFC forward slash scan now again elevated credentials on your command prompt and you can see that it actually did find a corrupted file and repaired it. I went and looked at my log my CBS log file and I was able to determine it was a .NET framework file. Here is where I turn my log file into a text file and I can actually see what it actually did. And of course, if you're on a Windows server, you feel like you have corrupted or missing files, you can always go to restore your server from known good backups. Don't forget our video notes that you can download from the video description on YouTube. Also, you can download the slide deck. It's a great way to review everything you just heard. It helps you retain this information. Thank mm -hmm. you.